Bonjour à tous mes amis. Good afternoon. Hey everybody. Hey, Nancy. I think you're muted, Nancy. How are you? Very good, thank you. Good, good. I'm going to put myself back on the beach again this week. You must still be at you still be at work, are you? Yes. <laughs> but I did find a separate room, so I'm not having to wear my mask. Eddie, have you met Nancy? Not uh, not yet. I not guess this is our virtual meeting. Yeah. Nice nice to meet you, Nancy. Nice to meet you guys. Glad to be here. All right. We'll uh, go ahead and call this meeting to order. It's uh, four o'clock. Looks like we're right on the dot there. So, um, are there missing, any announcements? We're still missing. Oh, there we have a quorum. Okay. I don't know what is a quorum. We have eight members. We need five. It seems like we go over this every week, every month. Um, is it four? Well, it's a majority of a. Uh, now the quorum would be. Five, I would think. Uh, I'm not sure. We have no legal advice on board here. I could look it up here. Well, we can go anyway. It doesn't make any difference. We can. Were there any uh, announcements? See none. Any public comment? Penny on here. Okay. Well, I guess we can move on to uh, the approval of minutes uh, from January 5th, uh, the special meeting. I was not able to attend that meeting. I apologize. I had um, something else going on at that time. I had a couple of questions on that. Um, I, would, I had written down the names of the people that were at the meeting because I didn't know anybody. And there was a tie tabbing on there. And I didn't see that on the attendance. And I didn't know if I I was supposed to be included as a guest or anything like that. Because I am quoted in the minutes. So I didn't know if they wanted to say that I was there or not. So Ty is a park board member. Um, he would have been attending um, just out of his own volition, I believe. Okay. Dale, you were there. Is that kind of what happened? You're you're muted, Dale. Sorry. Um, yeah, I would think Nancy needs to be noted as an attendee, the same as Ty, as non-members who are present. Uh, it doesn't make it's not a big deal. But uh, we're, did we have a quorum for that meeting? No. So there wouldn't even be any minutes. You don't have a quorum, you don't have a meeting. So I'm not sure why we would be voting on minutes. That was just me and Niall and uh, Shodorf. I think we're the only ones that were. So we didn't we didn't have a quorum, so there really aren't any minutes to approve. OK, I think I mean, that's I'm, good with everybody else. Uh, we can correct. move forward to item number two, new items for consideration. Did you get my email of uh, agenda items I wanted to add to the uh, I did, and uh, let's put those under, um, you know, item E. That's fine. On segment two there. Um, and then, Troy, did you have a chance to look over um, what Dale sent? Was it yesterday? Is that right, Dale? Yeah, I looked at it. Um, um, 
all we need to do is kind of like what we did uh, when we're talk talking about uh, the attendance uh, uh, requirements for the meetings. I mean, that's what we did with uh, uh, the other two attendees last summer was uh, I think that we uh, approached the two park board members at the next park board meeting and asked them to reach out to them to find out why they weren't attending and to see if they intended to be on it. And then if not, then we moved forward with removing them, uh, which Elizabeth Herlinski put together a letter that uh, I believe Penny sent out to those two members. And then we moved forward with re removing them. So. The, the, the bylaws aren't very descriptive of process, but it does say that the notice should be uh, provided by the clerk of the Board of Car Park Commissioners. I guess that's, is that Penny? That would be Penny, yes. So and could she do that at the direction of the Golf Advisory Committee or it doesn't say who directs her to do that. Um, it just noted that we are now on, a, on at least one member, four meetings in a row without attendance. Uh, it does give the respondent a, a chance to appeal and it needs to be noticed, but then we need to start the process. So uh, I, think, I, I think last time when we, we went through this um, uh, process, we it was direct, it was discussed at the park board meeting. Uh, and by I think either yourself or Eddie brought it up and talked about it with the two members that were appointed by those two park board members and they reached out to him and we still sent them the notice anyway, but I don't, I mean, that doesn't matter to me how we go about doing it. Well, it does say they're removed from office by the board of park commissioners. So let's put it on the agenda for the next park board meeting and get and leave it go for now. Okay. Um, I can tell you now that I have no information pertaining to the first T proposal. Uh, I'm not involved in that at all. And Mr. Houtman, uh, uh, has already left for the day. He had a meeting off site, so uh, he's not here. So I don't have anything pertaining to that. Um, discussion of maintenance priority list for 2021. Uh, that's pretty simple. We're waiting on the financial still from uh, the controller's office. They've yet to close the month of December or the month, the year of 2020 yet. Uh, we aren't sure when they're going to have that completed. Uh, so we'll have an idea of where we end up uh, in, in cash for year end. Uh, and then we'll see at the end of the first quarter. I think we talked about this briefly and because I think Mr. Schildorfer brought it up about when we would start looking at spending some money. And I made the statement would be after the first quarter. Um, so the things that we would be looking at doing after the first quarter would be fixing the weir at, and uh, ponds at uh, McDonald Golf Course and the uh, quote we got in 2019 to, from one vendor was about eighty-five to hundred thousand dollars somewhere in there that ballpark area to fix those ponds. Uh, we'd look at doing the roof at uh, Tex Consolver that needs to be replaced. That's about fifty thousand dollars, and then we'd probably look at replacing uh, the bridge that's um, uh, not being used at McDonald, uh, which we don't. The last time we replaced the bridge on number nine, that was about. Uh, $25,000 to replace that bridge. And then we kind of see where we stood uh, and move forward with other other projects then as we need to. So that would, that would kind of be a list Go. there. Yeah. I'll wait for him to get off the phone. I muted him. Go ahead. Um, Is there first, some reason I can't hear very well? I can. It sounds like uh, Troy's way off somewhere. I'm sorry, Richard. My, my my mic's about a foot and a half in front of me here on the top of my computer screen. So uh, I, I can hear him fine. So I moved up just a little bit. How's that? Niall Dilmer, little bit better, just, thank you. Niall Dilmer just called me and said he'll join us as soon as he can. So, okay. uh, Troy, what I'd like to see, I understand you mentioned some projects, but is there a priority list? Like, why are those projects first? Uh, what are the projects that most immediately impact the operation of the courses and um, are they prioritized in that fashion? Um, I don't know um, if the water issues at MAC 
are more important. Understand there and the bridge thing at Mac. Um, my friend AJ, who's part of our committee, had been snooping around. He thought that what he had heard is that bridge doesn't have to be replaced. It just needs to be largely just repaired. Uh, I don't know if your quote is for replacement, um, but I'd like to see if you could have a list of. There's got to be a list of the things that are needed to be done at the golf course. Mr. Hauptman has repeatedly referred to the millions of dollars that needs to be spent to improve the courses. I'd like to see that list. What has to be done first? What is essential to be done for the courses to operate this next year? What can be put on hold? Uh, because we need to accumulate more funds to get done. But uh, is that kind of list available? Could you publish that? Yeah, I can send you the golf sustainability study from 2018. It has that list in it. Well, I mean, this is your gig. You're the the manager, so I assume whatever. Yep, I send that to you. That's what we put together with the assistance of, uh, uh, you know, that was in 2018 that we put that together. We listed what it would cost to update and uh, modernize our irrigation systems. Uh, we had car replacement figured in there. I mean, I can send you that whole document, okay. which has all that in there. I keep hearing about equipment needs like mowers, certain mowers, certain uh, repair items. Uh, they'll all be on that list as well and prioritize. Yeah, they're on there. We, it was a 10 year plan is what we put together, so it'll be a couple okay. of years past too, but you know, it's just. That's great. That's great. That's a question that'll come up as a first T proposal. If it shows up, comes forward, how we handle those under a scenario of the city retaining control or if that's given to somebody else, how those things get done is an important consideration. So that's all right. I'll, if you could resend that, Troy, I'd appreciate that. Not a problem. We'll send it out to everybody. Thank you. Um, the uh, and y yes, the water issue at Mac probably would be a number one priority. I mean, the the, the pond uh, uh, has been leaking, so we've been able to re retain water above the irrigation pond and release it down into the irrigation pond when we needed it. But what we've run into is that the two ponds that have the ability to hold water, those valves have malfunctioned and quit working. So we are we're losing water uh, every day when we get rains that we could be should be able to store and use for irrigation purposes. So uh, in 2020, our irrigation costs have gone up at McDonald more than what they've been, uh, and that's part of the reason why in 2020 when we put together our CIP plan that was presented to the budget office and the CIP committee. Uh, we asked for money at that time to make those repairs uh, and they took it off the CIP budget. So uh, what, have, what have we budgeted for water at McDonald this year? Um, I asked Emma to give me a copy of what the 2021 line item budget is. Uh, we're probably budgeted for around sixty thousand dollars. I think that's what it's been in the past. Um, yeah, I can I can send it out if you guys want. Um, I can even send out this week for twenty twenty one. Um, all the budget for all golf courses and then all um, every line item that you need for. I can send them out by Friday. Would that work for you? I, I will send it to Hendrix and then he can distribute to whoever whoever might need a copy. Would that work, Hendrix? I believe I believe that's about fifty, probably fifty, probably about sixty thousand. I think is what the budget. I haven't seen it. Yeah, um, I honestly don't know. Broke it down by line yeah. item. Uh, okay. Emma, Emma, in yeah. your all sites in your all sites analysis, you sent me some time back. It showed for twenty twenty that the water appropriation was. I'm trying to find it here. Uh, 2020. I can look right now if you want. Uh, I've got it here too. Uh, um, water service was 116,000 in 2020. It was 47,000 in 2019, which I'm guessing is a reflection of the public water that had to be used to water McDonald. That's correct. So what have we have we carried that 116 forward to 2021? Uh, Probably not. It's probably back down to what was uh, uh, budgeted previously. I'm hoping it all depends on the rainfall too. I mean, we didn't have any rain for a long period of time, so if we get average rainfalls on a timely basis, we don't have to use city water very often over there. So, but we still need to fix the weir, and we need to fix those two valves on those ponds. And yes, we had some. Uh, uh, 
uh, park maintenance crew uh, came out last winter. They looked at that bridge on number 11. They brought in some companies that they do work work with that do concrete repairs and some different things uh, in dealing with bridges. And they said that the, the bridge needs to be worked on by a company that actually does bridge work, similar to what we did with number nine. So that's why the number I gave you, the 25,000, is what I would estimate uh, what that might cost, because that's what it cost us in I think it was 2015 to replace the bridge on number nine when it washed out. And it's never going to go anywhere again. I can guarantee you that. Well, I just want to make sure we're not just spending money to replace it. If we can do a short term interim um, repair. Uh, but that's that's an operational question I'll leave to you, but we'll be asking about it in future meetings, I guess, on how that's addressed. So thank you. OK. For the record, uh i finally got logged in this is nile can you hear me yep, yep. yep. fine Niall. welcome nile thank you Sorry. let's uh dale is that all you had on that particular topic on that one that's fine yeah okay uh, let's move on to uh the personnel updates uh as everybody's probably aware uh, Cody Lack accepted position uh, at uh, a golf course in El Dorado, Arkansas. He's going to, it's a, it's a great position for him. Um, he's going to be working uh, as the general manager of a uh, privately owned golf course. Uh, it's privately owned by a family there in El Dorado, Arkansas. Uh, he's gone back to work for Truman Golf Management. That's who he worked for for a number of years. Uh, so that's a great move for him and his family. He's going to, um, make a lot more money than he was making working here for us. Um, I can tell you that much. Uh, so he's got, he got, it was a wonderful job for him. So he's moved on. So what we've done is Cody Latt or, um, uh, Colin O'Brien, who's our, uh, uh, assistant golf professional that has been as a PGA member. Uh, he worked in 2019, at uh, as the interim head professional at McDonald Golf Course until we closed uh, uh, or 2018 and uh, until we have shifted people around at, uh, at, at, at McDonald. We've moved him over to uh, Sim Golf Course from Tex Consolver to work as the interim head golf professional uh, until uh, we determine uh, how we're going to go about filling that position. Um, so that's what we're doing there. Dale, you're muted. Sorry. Is there a particular need to have a PGA professional at Sim Park? It has no driving range, limited tournament activity. Uh, is there a possibility of operating that course in a similar fashion that CLAP was operated during its last several months with just minimal crew and loaned oversight from the other courses. Is that a operational option? I think that, uh, I mean, we could operate all the courses without a golf professional. I mean, there's nothing that says we have to have them at the golf courses. The point is, is we, you know, it's our second busiest golf course. Uh, and Colin has worked for us, um, well, probably close to 10 years within our golf system. And so he has and should have the knowledge of what we're wanting uh, our system to do and how to operate it. And I think you need to have somebody uh, more accountable at your second busiest golf course than just a couple seasonals running it. So I think that's an appropriate move. Isn't Colin involved uh, with the youth golf program at Tex, which is a very active program? He is involved with the, the teaching at Tex Consolver, just as he will be at, uh, at the golf course he's currently going to be at. Uh, I mean, his beginners ladies program that we you know we started taking lessons for booking lessons online. Uh, the ladies beginner program at Sim has already filled up and sold out. It doesn't start until April the 1st. So, you know, we're 45 days before that and it's already filled and we just posted him here after the first year so he'll be doing the instructions there he'll be running the junior program for the wichita junior golf foundation there <clears throat> so he'll be just as involved there as he was 
when he was at McDonald to working with the youth programs and stuff there. So nothing will change. Uh, and that's fine. My only concern is that I hear from the pros they are they are overworked, particularly at, at Tex and Auburn with keeping up those programs. There's no assistant at Auburn and now there's no assistant at Tex. You can only push these people so far. If you're going to keep these programs going, then it might be time to look at how you allocate resources to do that because uh, we you're going to lose more people. Uh, I don't know if Cody, I know I talked to Cody. That's a great opportunity, but I know there were some, I mean, there's ongoing concerns about what's going on here. I don't want to lose anybody else. And you're just loading up these, these remaining people at a work level and then furloughing them on top of that was ridiculous. But uh, I just hope you take a hard look at how you, what you really need to run a golf course and put the people necessary to keep the courses running. Um, it's not acceptable what's going on right now at Tex and Auburn. That's just not a long term. I think you'd agree, Troy. That's not the way you'd want to run the system. Well, we are when uh, we currently have Kent Purvis also at Sim Golf Course. He's going to work with Cody here for a couple of weeks and then when he's being transferred over to Tex to work with Steve, since that is our busiest golf course in the system. Um, I don't uh, disagree with your statement, but I'm also looking at uh, a couple different scenarios here. I mean, if we were to move forward and outsource the golf courses, how do I hire somebody and tell them that in 35, 30 days, you're not gonna have a job? I don't think that's fair to anybody. No, I know you're in limbo, Troy, right now with this first tee hanging over your head. Well, you kind of got to got to kind of assume that things are going to go on as they are now, absent any definite decision. So and the, that's the, a long. That's a, the that's the time to, of year. To, the decision to uh, eliminate the two assistant golf professional positions was done through uh, in 2018 or, or 2019. It was pertaining in those two years. And working with budget that in order to uh, uh, make things work, the, their recommendation was the eliminating of those two positions. It's not all four of them. So, okay. Well, I'd like to reach out to Niall and Nancy who, and, and Richard who go to these courses. What do you see something similar that the way we do things now might be done more efficiently? Might we? Uh, um, I, I know Niall and I have seen some of the, uh, the, particularly the young women that have been hired at Sim Park who have been spectacular in their management abilities and often outperform the pros uh, just in customer service and getting people on the golf course, which is what it's all about. Uh, what do you guys think of that? Niall, Nancy? I don't know that I play at all the courses consistently enough to see everything, but I do think customer service is a really important uh, factor that uh, we need to push, and I don't. I don't know as far as the back room operations, as far as the lessons that are given and the management of the pro shop specifically. I don't know that I'm well versed in those things at this time. Now, when it comes to uh, the uh, programming pertaining to the golf clinics and those things, those are all. Those aren't schedules that I say okay. Pro at Sim, these are the lessons you're going to teach this year. Pro at Mac, these are the ones you're going to teach. And at Tech, you're going to teach these. And Auburn Hills, you're going to teach these. The programming that is being done at those golf courses is set up by those golf professionals. They're the ones that do the scheduling of those, those clinics. They set those up to at the times that they feel like they're capable of doing those. And I, we've seen... Uh, in the last couple of years, some of the things that we've been doing and that we had done previously that we're doing a little bit less because of the staffing issues. So, you know, a lot of those things, uh, you know, they they control that. We aren't dictating to them which programming they have to do. The only one that's kind of dictated to them is the Junior Golf Foundation program. You know, my, my two cents is... Uh, I'm not sure that we, um, and I've said this before, I should not 
look at changing our system to make it to where there's more uh, responsibility and authority at the individual golf courses uh, under a pro to actually um, be able to um, um, run the course efficiently at that level. Um, when we don't have a pro there and you talk to anybody about anything, they they defer. They say, well, you know, you'll have to talk to the pro about that. If we don't have anybody there with authority, I hazard to guess what it would be like. I just close with, I, I think going forward, taking a look at what you need to run a golf course. As Troy said, it doesn't necessarily require a PGA professional. That's a nice feature to have, but when we're up against the financial restraints, we are, uh, we have the most efficient model that in the end of the day, it's about having people playing golf, having a good golf experience. As Nancy said, customer service is the number one criteria. The course of the, the, the condition of the course, and how you're treated when you're there. And we'll get into this more when we talk about the marketing plan. That is marketing. Um, marketing, as Richard noted, that's it's the person at the, uh, the counter where that all begins. So we can we can delay the risk this, to that discussion of marketing, if that's all right. Okay, well, we'll go back to, uh, hey, how's that? Round yep, support. that works. Um, everybody should have received the rounds report. Uh, we had a good month in December at uh, all the four courses. Uh, we had 6,683 rounds played at the four golf courses in December. Uh, in 2019, we had 3,860 rounds. Um, 2,918 and 3,700 3, and 2,416. So we were up 73% over 2019 in rounds in the month of December. Uh, year to date, we ended up with 145,000 rounds, uh, which was up 14% uh, over 2019, uh, which that includes the two courses being closed for three weeks uh, and two courses being closed for the seven weeks. So in my mind, I think we ended up having a very good year. Uh, revenue wise, I have no idea where we're at. Like I said earlier, we're still waiting on budget office or the controller's office and the finance department to close the year uh they were supposed to have closed it uh 10 days ago and haven't done it yet so we aren't sure when it's going to happen um hopefully soon and then we should have some numbers then um any questions on that those December numbers are great, and January's turned out pretty good. I'm going to take a cheap shot at Eddie here. When I made the Lincoln proposal presentation, and you, Eddie, asked Troy Halvin, isn't the playing system season the same here as it is in Lincoln, Nebraska? And Halvin said, yeah, it is. We all take the same three days off. They had 15 inches of snow in Lincoln yesterday. So I think we're going to have a little longer season here in Wichita this year. Well, hopefully that's not blowing south. I just uh, figured we're kind of in the similar, you know, geography on the map. And okay. uh, yeah, so <laughs> I appreciate it. That's good. That's good. Uh, one of the things that uh, I believe you mentioned, Mr. Goder, was pertaining to uh, diversity and inclusion in our programming. Am I correct? Yes. I know Mr. Halvin said he had shared that concern that we, and I looked at the marketing document you sent out i saw no reference i know there was a reference to promoting women's golf i'd like nancy to talk about the sufficiency of that but i saw no reference to minority golf promotion um and, and i know that uh, i'm work we've worked with nancy and i had worked with george kolb over the last couple of years who's the president of the Mc, the mcadams group there is an active minority group but i don't see anything that really tries to uh, extend a welcome to that community going forward well when, when the tournaments i'm just gonna, we're, we're just going to start with the, the the programming that we do which is the the spreadsheet that was sent out uh if you want to put that up penny it would be great um we conduct a number of tournaments at our golf courses and these are the ones that uh, the golf professionals run 
Prior to 2015, the city of Wichita did not host any tournaments um, for the community to participate in. Uh, since 2015, we've done, we, here, here's the list of the tournaments uh, at the golf courses and which golf courses we host them at. Uh, and as you can see, uh, uh, well, for example, the 27 hole challenge, we started out in 2015 with 34 participants, ended up with 84 in 2019. Uh, this last year, when we were able to start hosting tournaments, we hosted the Folds of Honor Tournament at Auburn Hills. That was the first year we'd hosted that event, and Scott had 116 participants in that. Uh, the parent junior that we host at McDonald, you can see that since 2016, we didn't have anybody sign up for it, but then 2017, 18, 19, and then in 2020 here, we had 60 participants. That tournament seems to be growing, and um, that's just a nine-hole event for a parent and a junior to play in. Uh, so, you know, our golf professionals determine what are the tournaments that they want to host. They determine what the format is going to be. And then we provide and put the flyers together based on the information they get. We publish it out. We do the, the charging of the fees and stuff through our web store. And what we've seen, we started to see people participating in these events because they're looking for things to do. Uh, when we look at our group lessons, when we look at that, these are beginners lessons that are being held at Auburn Hills. I mean, we try to, like I said earlier, the, the beginning lessons for 2021 at SIM on starting on April of the 1st, that one is full and that's with 10 participants. And, you know, so it's already filled up. So we're targeting couples. We have be, uh, couples beginners lessons. Uh, we've done those in the past. We've targeted ladies only because ladies have a tendency to be overwhelmed if they're in a uh, group lesson with men. So that's why we specifically target the ladies. Um, we also do, uh, in the way of junior golf, uh, Steve Blasky has some junior development lessons that he does out at uh, text consolver. Uh, I know uh, in the past we've done different junior lessons on Saturday mornings at Auburn Hills. I did that when I was there that weren't affiliated with the Junior Golf Foundation. They were just junior less clinics that we did on the weekends. Um, so we do a lot of teaching uh, that's not necessarily, I get, the only thing that's directed towards any specific ethnicity is the beginning ladies programming. Okay, Troy, let me stop you at that point. I heard nothing in that recitation of a specific effort to reach out to minority golfers, Asians, Latinos, African Americans. Um, because we don't discriminate against anybody at our public courses as to who utilizes. Yeah, Troy, them. Troy, and let me stop wasn't. you there. Saying you don't discriminate against anybody means you're discriminating against everybody. From there are there are shortcomings in our approach to marketing our golf to our minority community that's pretty obvious you need you have nothing that i can see uh, kyle you're a member of that community do you see anything in there that uh, have you spoken with uh, mr kolb or some of those mcadams folks about their interaction with the golf division i have not well and maybe it's just me and i'll quit talking about it but i see absolutely nothing here that would indicate we are responding to what is a more current concern about minority inclusion in this public program. You're doing the same thing next year you did last year. And as far as minority inclusion, that's not sufficient. Um, and if I'm the only one that believes that, I'll stop talking and we'll move on. And Dave, what would you like to see? I'd like to see a specific effort to identify that community. There is a uh, adult African American group that works out of McAdams, and uh, there are boys clubs, girls clubs around the city. There are uh, neighborhood centers working with. If, if you think you're just going to wait for them to show up, that isn't going to happen. There are a lot of minority golfers. I see them on the golf course all the time. They enjoy it as we do. But it's an intimidating environment for some that perhaps might be and the history of our system. I've personally experienced the discrimination against women. 
at Tex Consolver in past years. It's, it is, uh, that's a matter of fact. I'm glad that that's changing and I think that's a good thing to do, but um, if this is what we're gonna do, this doesn't look like minority inclusion. Well, I can tell you that uh, when Colin O'Brien was over there as the assistant, he did work with the McAdams Junior Program, giving them group lessons. Um, I'm not sure if he still is working with them, but I know he has in the past. I know that um, uh, George Cole, we put together, as Shanna put together their flyer for their McAdams tournament. He's helped, she's helped them with that and making that for them. Uh, so we've worked with them on a couple different things. So it's not that we're opposed to working with them. We will work with them when, when they, you know, I know that uh, I know with the Junior Golf Foundation uh, in the when it started a years and years ago, uh, Marge Page offered to bring instructors to the McAdams Recreation Facility, and that didn't go over with them there. So we're, we've, we 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 don't do any. We have our programming set so that we can reach as many people as we can. I know that the Junior Golf Foundation. Uh, I mean, we had 619 kids in the Junior Golf Foundation programs that we end up teaching. Um, I can probably get the statistics from uh, them to see what the minority breakdown was. I don't know if they even keep track of that, but I can try to find that out. Try. I don't know that that's critical information, particularly. But I just I going along with Dale, I just think there might be some missed opportunities that we can do some some more outreach in the marketing area, even if it's just uh, finding ways to infiltrate those different um, organizations. I know we work with uh, Envision, which is right across down Main Street here. Uh, we work with them um, that they bring uh, out to, to McDonald uh, the last uh, four or five years. Uh, uh, some of their uh, handicapped players that uh, are vision impaired with their sighted uh, people to help them learn to play golf. So we've been working with them for the last five years at least. So we are reaching out to groups. So uh, This is Kyle. I think if I can interject real quick, I think to, to Dale's point, I mean, I guess I understand like at the end of the day, um, you know, I, I run a nonprofit here in town that works with kids and a uh, majority of us minority boys. And I think about like our mentors and I could think right now I could run off 10, 10 of the guys uh, who mentor on our program that are avid golfers. I mean, we golf together all the time. Um, and so I think Dale's just speaking to that intentionality and like, what can we do currently? Um, cause for example, um, knowing that I have a, a bunch of guys that golf that are, you know, adults and then knowing we work with kids, like, is there, um, I guess, I guess it's just like there could be some more strategic conversation and some, again, just intentionality, um, and, and trying to, uh, I guess just bridge that gap. And, and also to Dale's point about the. Um, I think changing the perception, right? Actually, I think about my uh, my program manager who over the summer, um, she's married to, he's he's actually a mentor in our program. She's black and he's white and they were at the golf course and, um, and you know, she she definitely felt discriminated against, you know, just, just being there. And I think there were jokes made from other golfers in regard to her being like his caddy or something like that. Um, you know, when actuality, she's just out with her husband, but they actually didn't, the assumption was that they weren't married, um, the way that it was, uh, gone. And so I think, so her being a woman and being a black female, um, I just saying, I can understand Dale's point about what can we be doing on our end to, to help, um, educate not only golfers that already exist, but also how can we introduce young people that may not think the golf course welcomes them to the game. But th those weren't any comments from our staff, were they, Kyle? No, no, they were other. They were golfers out on the course. Oh, okay. And that's well said, Kyle. Uh, if nothing else, Troy, in the promotional material we put out, just having more black faces, more Latino faces, just as a presence, so that when they look at it, they can see an environment where they would be welcome. Um, I've had, you know, city council members, a former city council member, who well, I truly admire has said it's this is a white man's game it's an old white man's game and we got to get past that and we got to do that aggressively it's got to be 
I'd say organizing, uh, doing what you can to organize events that attract that group. And if you're going to spend marketing money, spend it in that direction uh, to make it work. But but thank you, Kyle, for those observations. I'm glad to hear your involvement in it. Uh, those are the things that change the uh, change the parameters. So. Thanks, my Dale. Schnauzer, my Schnauzer agrees with you if you heard. If I could share with the group some of the other okay, areas. Okay, uh, next is our snag, which is starting new at golf. Uh, you know, we've been doing programming and that since uh, uh, 2015. We've been doing it at all the golf courses. Uh, after visiting with the golf pros, we kind of set up a different schedule uh, where they only did it a couple of times at each one of the courses so that uh, we didn't have groups, even though we didn't, we're not, we're not, we don't do like recreation. If we don't, we don't set a minimum number uh, that if we don't get five kids enrolled, we cancel it. Uh, we've held snag programs with one or two people in it uh, because we feel like that we're still reaching out to the people that might be interested in learning to play golf. Um, but you know that's kind of what that is. It's uh, using new equipment that's been designed to work with children. Uh, uh, we also have taken the snag programs and gone to the Goddard grade schools and done uh, snag in schools for the PE teachers. Uh, so you know we're trying to, to go out and reach out to people that normally wouldn't be coming to the golf courses and some of those things. We've been doing the hook a kid on golf programs since 2015 and for those of you that aren't familiar with that program uh, what we do is they, they pay a small fee we ran some tournaments uh, through the city employees and held them uh, one in the spring and one in the fall to raise money uh, and that money all goes to buy the equipment that we provide each one of these children that signs up for that program uh, whether they played golf before or not or provided a set of clubs based on their height and their weight uh, whether they're left-handed or right-handed, um, the, the value of those clubs uh, uh, is about $137, and we get those in for them, and um, they get, go through a week of basic clinic with each one the golf, at the golf course um, in the mornings, um, and then the last day they get to go out and play three holes. It's just kind of more of an introduction. We started doing it over spring break. Excuse me to uh, you know, get those clubs in the kids' hands so then they might be interested in then signing up for the Junior Golf Foundation programming that starts shortly after that. So we've done a pretty good job of that. Uh, we also offer uh, the people and, and families the ability that if they don't necessarily have uh, the ability to pay the $75, we'll actually, if they can pay part of it, then we cover the other part in our fundraising efforts. So we try to make sure that we can get everybody out there that wants to do that. Um, we started in 2016 uh, uh, the Wichita Junior Golf Tour. I mean, it doesn't really sound like much. I mean, you know, you've got um, the Kansas Golf Association has a junior tour. The Midwest Section PGA has a junior tour. The South Central Section PGA has a junior tour. Uh, there's the uh, U.S. Kids Junior Tour. Uh, and all these kids all have to travel to go play somewhere. So what we started was one here in town that kids don't have to travel. They play on a Sunday afternoon uh, at our golf courses. It costs them $10 each week to play. We got prizes that we give out. And then we have uh, uh, the last, last tournament that we have is for those that, based on how you played during the series, you get points. And then the top eight or eight or 10 or 12 come back. And they play for a cup and we okay. give out trophies and and so we've had a pretty good turnout of that between 33 to 42 players uh, over the years so we've had a good turnout with that uh through the pga we've started doing the pga junior league it has done uh, uh pretty well at all the golf courses been well received uh we've also done something that since starting in 2016 was uh we provide uh, free golf lessons on a Sunday afternoon uh, in March, April, May, uh, August, September, um, and October, uh, which people can sign up, they call in, they register, say, I'm going to be there so we can keep track and let people know when it's full because we only have two golf pros there. That, you know, the whole idea behind it is get people out so they can come to the golf course and have an idea of, of and get some tips, uh, kind of learn what golf is about. If they haven't played, get some tips if they had. And we, we want to make sure that they have the opportunity to, you know, be welcome to the golf courses and make things easy. 
Okay, Troy, Troy, I appreciate all that detail, but just if perhaps for the next meeting, if you might describe how all those things speak to this issue of diversity inclusion. Nothing, I mean, I know what you've done. Those are great programs, but none of what you described had any particular element of how they particularly tried to reach out to a newer audience. So going forward, you don't need to tell me any more about what you've done. Those are fine programs. But the concern here is about as Mr. Hauptman echoed, the need for diversity. So something that specifically addresses that and that identifies the impact of it would like to hear in the future. Okay. You know, uh, as a practical matter, um, just thinking about it logistically, um, is that something that we should reach out to First Tee uh, about regarding the programs to to uh, try to get uh, minorities involved in golf at a young age? Um, because I'm not sure how else you do it. Well, it is about communicating to those publics. Kyle, you mentioned your organization has uh, youth organizations that may not interact with golf right now. So perhaps initiating some conversations with those kinds of organizations where maybe there is a, I, I think of Bob Lutz running grew, uh, running a League 42. What a tremendous effort that was to create a program that that did reach out to the minority community and, it, and he found a way to do it. I think we need something of similar energy on the golf front. First Tee is a fine program, but it's a, it's a country club weighted program. There's no doubt about that. And I know they do things in the public schools and they have public uh, programs of the public courses, but they operate also largely on the country clubs. That's And they should. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, junior golf just kind of takes who comes in, but um, it's about making an effort. Do you want to change something or do you want to make it have it changed for you? I love Nancy's quote about, you know, you can't make, you can't change the people, but you can make them change the way they do things. Something like that, Nancy, I remember, but um, Anyway, I'll, I'll I'll let it go with that. I just would like to see a little more specific the presence of minorities in our promotional materials and something as aggressive as League 42 on the golf front would be an interesting thing. And I think if I could say one last thing, I mean, as I was listening to the different programs and things offered, you know, I, I can understand a, a see a strategy uh, or, you know, who knows? All I'm saying is I'm on this call and I'm hearing these programs and I'm like, oh, okay. Um, you know, for me and my organization, like I have the funding to, you know, some of these things you're throwing out there or that you mentioned that y'all do, like I have the money to be able to pay for some groups uh, or young, you know, young boys and potentially even young girls to, to participate in these, in, in these things. Um, but to, you know, I mean, that's, and that's, that's just everything in general. A lot of things are siloed and people are in their own bubbles. And um, sometimes people just don't know about the opportunities that are out there. But I can tell you now, just hearing about these, I'm like, oh, well, I'd pay the money to get some kids in that. Um, but I'm hearing about it now. And I think maybe to what Dale's speaking of is there are other organizations that need to hear about this that already have the funding and just are looking for things to give the opportunity to. So, um, um, I'm, I'm actually super excited about some of the stuff that's going on, and I'll be looking to uh, get some kids involved this spring. That's great, Kyle. I appreciate that. Dale, if you weren't such a good weather man, I'd uh, nominate you to be the next Bob Lutz for our <laughs> golf program. Oh, I have my role, you know. <laughs> Yeah. So if everybody's good on the uh, the diversity and inclusion slash programming um, conversation, we can uh, move forward to the marketing plan, which I believe was distributed to the group. Yeah, you want to put that up then? Hopefully everybody had the opportunity to, to, to read it. That's why we uh, tried to get it out so everybody had a chance. Um, I know Shanna's on the call here. She I'm going to have her chime in on this because... Uh, She's the one that does the majority of our, she's working with our uh, communications team. And she also, that's forestry. Um, she also works with um, uh, the marketing companies uh, for everything that we do. So Shannon, you wanna talk about this a little bit? Uh, 
That's okay. And we can talk about forestry. I mean, I have no problem with that. Can everyone hear me okay? I tried chiming in earlier when you were talking about diversity to share some things, but I don't think anyone heard me, so I wasn't sure if my mic was working or not. We hear you now. Thank okay, you. good deal. No worries. Um, we can come back to it if you want. No. There we go. Um, we try to use our resources uh, effectively. We try to use everything that we do um, and, and make sure that we are spending our money wisely. Um, I guess we look at it as if it was our own money, which is, I guess, the way we should look at it, uh, because in, th in theory, it probably is. Um, so I'll let Shanna go through this real quick, uh, because she does the, the, the biggest majority. She works with our mobile app provider um, and works with the communications teams. Uh, so Shanna, you want to take it away? Sure. Can you hear me OK? A little louder. How's that? I can hear you fine. I don't know about everybody else. Okay. You just have a softer voice than the men. I guess. <laughs> um, so what we deal with each year is a minimized budget for marketing. Um, we typically get about $40,000. And in the past, um, $10,000 of that has gone to the Gulf Wichita mobile app, which we have found to be one of our most effective sources of communication. Um, if you look through here, you'll notice all the different resources that we utilize. Um, media buys with cop media, uh, purchasing television and radio ads. And typically with those ads, we try to target youth uh, 17 and under, males 25 to 44, and males and females 55 plus. Uh, the thought process there is that um, with the majority of our golfers right now currently being seniors, we need to find younger golfers to replace those seniors as they move out of golfing um, when they're unable to do that any longer. So uh, targeting males and females 55 plus is strategic because that's around the time people start uh, looking at retirement, looking for hobbies, and golf is a great uh, avenue for them to pursue. And that's why we offer so many um, ladies golf lessons like Troy mentioned. Uh, we try to keep them um, with just the group of ladies so they feel more comfortable. We put out a survey and we found that ladies feel very overwhelmed trying to golf with a group of strangers, let alone a group of men. So they're more comfortable when it's more social atmosphere. So that's why we have the majority of ladies lessons versus anything else. Um, we also use uh, direct email marketing, which our email database has grown, um, I think, in 2015 when we started utilizing Constant Contact. We only had about uh, 4,000 emails in our database because we just did not do a very good job of collecting that information at the check-in. And now with having a pop-up ad in our website that collects that information along with the memberships and the staff doing a really good job behind the counter, collecting the contact information, we've been able to grow our email database to almost 20,000 emails, which is fantastic. Um, our mobile app, when we started with this in 2016, um, our, our goal was to have 1,000 downloads by the end of the year. And over four years now, we're almost at 19,000 downloads. Um, 6,000 of those are active, over 6,000. And over 4,000 of those receive the push notification, which is instant direct messaging. So anytime we want to get a message out there, um, we're able to do that with a push of a button uh, with the push notifications in the mobile app. Shannon, uh, what, is the yeah. definition, what is the definition of uh, active downloads? 
So anyone that is currently using the mobile app on their phone right now, the total downloads is how many times the app has been downloaded since its conception. And during that time, people may have moved away from Wichita or they may have just stopped using the app because they found a GPS app model that they like to use better. So they've uninstalled the app or maybe somebody's gotten a new device and they just didn't reinstall the app on the new phone. So that's uh, what they have. Does it mean they have used it or they've just downloaded it? Um, total downloads means that they have downloaded it and they have logged in uh, with their name and email. At least once per season or one time. One time. OK. Yeah. Thanks. Uh-huh. Um, so Penny, if you don't mind scrolling down, please consider to send out a survey in August of 2020, um, trying to find out how golfers uh, best prefer their communication. And it's always interesting to me how much emphasis gets put into Facebook and uh, Twitter and Instagram. People think that that's got to be the number one driving force of your marketing platforms. When in reality now, because that market is so saturated, only 3% of your followers see your content in their feed on a daily basis. So trying to find other avenues, especially for the golf division is really important. When you look at uh, the other social media accounts throughout the city, um, our park recreation department has 11,000 followers, whereas we have 3000. So it's even more important for us to find how to best communicate with our golfers. And when we ask, we find out that our mobile app, our emails and our website are the top three. Um, social media and uh, print signs in the clubhouses are the least favored. And that just is, is just another way of showing that our website traffic is one of the most important things that we have to consider when we are trying to um, market to our golfers. We want to make sure all the information is readily available and that the site is functional and easy to navigate for the customer. We don't want them having to do multiple clicks to get somewhere. We want it to be two to three clicks or less. Um, and there just gives you a little background about Facebook, like I mentioned, um, the reach that we get. And you can keep going, Penny. Um, one of my personal favorites is Google Business. Um, everyone searches Google or some sort of internet search model. And the analytics you get back from Google is alarming and really impressive, especially when you have it set up for your business. Um, there's no cost for it. You can post on it just like you do social media. But another thing that we're able to do is utilize uh, Google ALO, which is direct texting. So our customers can go to Google and message us directly through text messages asking us questions. And I get several of those a week asking if we rent golf clubs, uh, what our hours are, um, if uh, they have to uh, rent a golf cart, things like that. So a lot of it's used from people coming from out of town visiting. Uh, a lot of business travel, we see the use of Google ALO as well. Penny, you can keep scrolling. Um, so just to go over our marketing plan for 2021, we'll continue to use the email service, uh, our website, social media, and community calendars such as Visit Wichita, the Chamber of Commerce, and Wichita on the Cheap. Um, those are all free resources to us that target uh, various demographics and uh, Wichita on the Cheap is a great one for diversity. Um, push notifications to market all of our programming. And this uh, does target new customers, but it helps us capture, uh, or I'm sorry, this helps us target existing and new customers uh, when we utilize the community calendars. Um, we will be purchasing $9,000 in uh, uh, media buys through COP Media to utilize Google Display and retargeting ads uh, to promote the golf membership from April to June. And then um, we'll continue to utilize the app and the tournament wizard for tournaments. Um, that cost to us is a little over $10,000. And then we will continue to promote the tournaments with uh, the large 22 by 28 uh, 
posters that the golf professionals really like having in the clubhouses. And um, Penny, you want to scroll on down? Uh, you went a little too far. Sorry. Right there is good. So as of right now, we are budgeted to spend a little over eleven thousand dollars, leaving about twenty eight thousand in reserves um, just because of the situation uh, that we're in right now with uh, first tee. Um, we want to be able to remain fluid with our marketing dollars and not be locked into anything that would uh, potentially be a downfall for us in losing that money. Um, and we've touched on all the different programming that we do and how we target youth and women. And I, I would like to point out when uh, targeting women, we really focus on the leagues. Um, I communicate directly with each league, um, letting them know that uh, we will be happy to promote their, their kickoff uh, nights and meetings for the season. Uh, we're happy to post any photos that they have. Um, I, I work with uh, WAGA to set up their email database uh, so they can send out email blasts to women golfers in the community. Um, so we do everything we can to be um, helpful and assist with the ladies leagues and, and even the men's leagues, I reach out to them too, but it seems like the ladies like to communicate with me more than the men do. So I, I have a, a, a stronger relationship with them and we do um, a lot of uh, sharing of content and we post that in email blasts and we send it out in the push as well. Any questions? I think uh, if I can be heard, um, I think that your marketing to women is is very astute. I, I think your examination of how they like to play and what they um, um, uh, find as uh, attractions or unattractions to their experience, but I think you're you're right on track with um, what they like and what they don't like and I think that's your, there's a really big market there and I'm, I'm glad you're reaching out to them in the way you are. Yeah, this is Nancy. I agree that um, I've been a part of WAGA for 38 years or whatever and, and Business Women's Golf League has been my ladies group. Um, I've been, mem I've been um, very active in that and I wasn't aware that the city really reached out very much. So this may be more recent developments in the last maybe two years. So I appreciate that. Um, and uh, each of the clubs has the ladies groups and they organize their own tournaments. And basically we've always just coordinated with the pros or the golf courses. And so getting these our leagues promoted in print before, I mean, in addition to the apps and such, but the getting them on print so that people, I guess, oh, let me think what I'm saying. It's people who are already involved in golf in the community that are using the app and the online sources. Um, it's when people go to an, into a clubhouse, they wanna see, oh, Here's some ladies things going on. So the more posters, those kinds of things that we're reaching out pe to people who are not already actively involved. And I, that goes for kids and men, couples, everything too. So I'm glad that you're doing that, Shanna. Thank you. Yeah, I've got a couple of questions real quick. Um, first, um, <clears throat> because of the pandemic, we do have a bounce. And these are folks that... Um, um, obviously use, uh, know how to play and use our services. Do we have any way of being able to tell how long is it, how long it's been since they played last so that if we go into a period where uh, the pandemic is starting to get behind us and they, we don't have the same um, uh, active um, uh, folks playing that we can send them something saying basically we miss you and um, try to figure out a way to get them back out to the course. Um, 
our software does allow us to do that. And in 2019, um, we did that with um, golfers that we noticed we hadn't seen in three months, six months, and 12 months. And we had uh, an offer where we invited them to come back. And I, I think we gave them 50% off the round, inviting them to come back. Troy, do you remember? Is that correct? Or was I think it? That's right. I think that's correct. Or it was either come play on us if you bring a friend, so what, an offer like that. And um, we, we saw a little bit of traction from that, but not a ton. Well, yeah, but that's, uh, this is a different time now. And uh, we, we're going to have a lot of those folks, I think. And, and number two, just wondered, um, you know, I sent out a, um email today uh, just wondering if we ought to have a kind of an executive uh, membership for people that we're trying to uh, wean over from uh, country clubs or um, uh, folks that we are uh, trying to get off the couch and back into the game. Donna, did you get that? Yeah, I heard that. Um, you know, that was something that got brought up when we were rolling out the memberships. And if I remember correctly, one of the concerns was if we offered a temporary membership, only a, a partial amount of time out of the year, what would draw people to oh, no, no, I'm, not, the, the I'm saying this would be a yearly membership. I'm sorry, I didn't catch it, that. It would be a yearly membership. In other words, it would only be for two rounds a month. But a yearly membership. For oh, people. two golfer. Okay, I thought you were saying only two months. No, two rounds a month for all year. So, do you think that would benefit executives if it was just them playing free? Because a a lot of executives tend to bring business partners to the. Well, courses. don't know, don't don't think about executives. That would just be the name of it. It's people who play country clubs. I have a lot of friends who play country clubs, but have friends who are uh, playing city courses. This allows them to play with their friends. In the meantime, we get their money over the winter. Um, we can use it for not only the individuals that are uh, in the country clubs, but also for people who uh, were trying to get back in and who, uh, if let's see, as a present to a husband, to say, "What well, get, this gets you out twice a year, twice a month, um, and and at a reduced rate, um, we might be able to turn them back into members." My whole thing is, uh, when do we you you know it's it's the call to action in advertising is trying to figure out how you're going to get somebody that really is going to use your product. And golf is very, is a very complex and difficult game. So if you have people that are uh, skilled at the game to start with and know how to play, as opposed to your new golfers that have, what is it, um, nine, uh, nine and 10, don't pick it up. Um, as opposed to marketing to people who don't play as much and we're trying to get them back into, um, as I said, into the game. I'd like to bring up one other aspect. Those are great uh, individual efforts to reach specific audiences, which is necessary. But in the big picture, what I think we're missing is that golf is marketed at the golf course. It's the experience of hitting a golf ball and how people treat you at the golf course. And that falls to the pros. So I would like to think that we would redirect some of our marketing and involve the, the golf pros, the people behind the counter. Because in the end, I, I saw that in a PGA document where golf, the good thing about golf, it said, is that marketing is that it markets itself. So the the way you expand your base is to provide that great experience and put that burden more on the pros. I understand what Shanna's doing on a 
administrative level with the technologies and the the uh, you know the, the the apps and all of that. But at the end of the day, it's and Eddie, I know you're the you, you understand this. But it's what you experience on the golf course, and you'll communicate that to others. That's where they think the real big growth opportunities are. But Dale, I, I this would be, and I understand what you're saying, but this would be the marketing to people who have played golf who aren't going out as often if we can get those people to play more often no richard i understand that's a great idea there's nothing wrong that's a good and those are targeted but in a bigger picture that's one element that would help grow it certainly but i think overall putting the responsibility for the big number on the people who are running the golf courses is where we should place our emphasis the the golf pros those pga professionals Troy, you know this is what they teach you at these schools. So let's use that expertise to, uh, if we're going to drive the number, I don't think it's going to come so much from a golf app or a Facebook page. It's going to come from people having a good experience on good golf courses and telling their friends this is a good thing to do. Um, just, just It all fits together in one grand plan, but I don't want to get lost in all these specific things and ignore the general, which is where our big dollar um, impact would fall. Okay. So Dale, I agree with you. I think it is about the experience and that's something that we uh, talk with the staff about. And I think all of our golf pros do a great job uh, with customer service, creating an enhanced experience for the golfer to make them want to come back. And I think our maintenance staff does a great job with course conditions, especially with the constraints that they have. So I think our staff does a really fantastic job and and they practice that daily. And I mean, I I think they're doing that day in and day out. And that's just a part of the experience that they offer at a course level. I don't I don't necessarily agree that it's a marketing aspect because I think that's something that should happen daily. And I think our staff do that. I don't sense I don't sense that the golf pros are feeling like they're in charge. I and mean, that's a, well, that's, we've got that's, two a golf that's a dynamic that here. needs to change. We've got two golf pros on here and I mean I think they should speak for themselves if they feel like they run their operation about making the customer's experience number one priority or if there's feedback there. I don't think this is the venue to do that. Um, this. But I will say this as a handicap player, uh, the the attention that I get and the courtesy I get is phenomenal. I think, uh, and and I can't say it's always was always that way before, but the last few years, I think we've got some really good people, and I think they do an excellent job. Now, what I think Dale is saying is uh, in order to keep good people, in order to have a system of accountability and, and to grow the system, yeah, as I said earlier, I, I'm all for um, providing more authority at the source because that's where decisions and, and the ability to sell the, the product is. So um, I'm all for that. But as far as, as, far as the, the friendliness and and um, the way people are treated, I, I've been treated incredibly well. Well, and the last thing I would just say is let's set some benchmarks. Let's there is a if golf is going to grow, we know we're going to do better this year because we got six weeks we're going to plug into the system we didn't have last year. The pandemic's still here. Golf is still a major opportunity to get outside and escape the pandemic. And I expect we're going to have a banner year. But uh, that said. I hope that we look at where the uh, recording, how that takes place at the clubhouse, surveying golfers who come in, uh, do they communicate to other golfers, giving some incentive to bring somebody in with you perhaps, but I, you know, I'm not an expert on that. I do know who the experts are. It's the golf professor and my schnauzer who is echoing everything I said. But uh, I, I would like to see more emphasis on the, at, at the point of sale thing at the clubhouse and to give the pros an incentive, give them something for their efforts. They're working for nothing essentially because we don't have that system. The ones that are doing a great job are doing it out of the love of the game and their dedication to the profession. But um, 
that's the part I'd like to see us address going forward. What are the impacts? How do you measure the return on investment that you're spending uh, on, the, on the things you're spending it on now? And is that the best place? Okay. You know, if I could uh, take just a moment, I don't know if anybody but Dale and Troy might remember, but uh, I was a member of this advisory group back in 2008, 2009, before my wife was elected to the city council. And I went back and looked at some of the files and the notes and the uh, reports that were generated back then, uh, just to compare to what is happening now. And I've just taken a little bit of a long view here compared to where we were at in 2008, 2009, in terms of our marketing uh, and the sophistication of that marketing and the targeting of that marketing, we've come a very, very long way. Um, not that we have saturated uh, this market by, by any means, but I think we have uh, done a, you guys have done a very good job of, uh, of penetrating that market um, uh, and accomplishing one of, some of the, um, the is, uh, addressing the issues that were being addressed back in 2008, 2009. I think it's just worth taking a moment to, uh, to reflect on that long view and, and see how far we've come. I, I do agree that Dale has a point when he's talking about uh, the uh, clubhouse experience um, uh, is uh, just as important as the golf course experience. And uh, in that reflect in that way, uh, I think also we've, we've come a long way. I remember back 2008 and 2009, back in those years, um, privately, we would all talk about how um, just utterly lacking customer service was at the golf uh, uh, shops, the pro shops, the concession stands. Um, just in general, it was it was not nearly to the level that it is today. Uh, so I think we're moving in the right direction. Those things take time, but I think it's worth. Um, uh, giving credit where credit's due for the fact that we have come quite a ways from those years. And Niall, that's a valid point, but add a caveat. In 2012, the Gulf system realized a net income of $790,000 and repaid 241000 of its Auburn Hills debt. That was 2012. So whatever we've done in marketing between 2012 and now has been straight downhill um, and, and I understand there are national trends that were in play but other communities did better um, I don't think we've looked at that big number along the way we just kind of accepted what was happening without intervention you're right I think there it's more sophisticated now at the end of the day it's the big number in 2012 that was a million dollars in the plus and that's only eight years ago what did we do in these last eight years that drove us down that same period of time? I know you're tired of hearing me say this. Lincoln, Nebraska went up the same amount. So there was a, it's worth looking at how we're addressing it. And I do think it starts at the clubhouse um, going forward. And for us to be successful, we are in a great place right now. And thanks to the folks who made that happen, that we are have a plus number at the end of the year and it should be a plus number next year so it's a matter of building on what worked but let's not forget where we were and what the reality of the numbers are uh, we just can't say things are great when they're not and if we need to change we need to change and that's what this committee is about it's interesting that in that same year and uh, now you remember this when the gulf advisory committee was formed it was charged with the task of looking at operations and what they recommended in 2012 was that the golf the golf system should be put under the finance department because the golf advisory committee that year said the golf division was incapable of doing the job. The manager rejected that idea at that point. And here we are eight years later. We just need to, it's that old Einstein thing. You keep doing the same thing over and over and expecting it to change. Um, that isn't 
where we need to be. So I'm glad this discussion is taking place. It it is all dependent on come with this this first T thing to start with. But, um, I think this is a good exercise in seeing where we are and where we should be going. So for me, I mean, I I look at course conditions number one, course layout. If I like the course, if I want to go play it again, and number two. Uh, how I'm treated in the clubhouse, not only by the staff, but when I walk in, is it, shall I say, stuffy? Is it laid back? Um, is the floor clean? Is does it feel nice? Um, that's what keeps me coming back. But I want to I want to move this discussion forward, um, bring it back to 2021, if you will. And Kyle, I want to ask you, man, you work with, uh, you know, you work with kids. You're a young professional yourself. Do you see any ways, I know we've touched on it a little bit in the last hour or so, but do you see any ways of uh, how we can capture, you know, the young golfer that that may not golf, you know, a whole lot or or never? Um, how do we get them out there? And then secondly, I want to I want to go to Nancy and, and ask the same question for young women golfers. How do we capture that demographic as well? Go ahead, Kyle, if you want to. Go first. We'll let Kyle be, gather his thoughts. He might be <laughs> walking the dog. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Um, to reach the younger women, you know, I I've played golf my whole life, uh, so I think I think truly for young women is getting them, getting more young women to play golf in high school. I really do. And I think the city has a big hand in helping um, promote that in the schools, even even just the local pros, each each public school, as well as the uh, not the, the private schools and the uh, Catholic schools and such. I think that the pros from the different city courses could even reach out to those schools and promote. That's I think. That's where I see a lot of young women getting started. And they may be out of the golf world for 10 or 20 years, but they know how to play and they'll get back in. And that and, and the junior golf is huge. My two daughters did the junior golf at, at, in Wichita as young girls. Now they're in their early 30s and they're starting to get back to playing in little social uh, leagues or just coming to Wichita and playing with mom for a while or whatever. But I think it's just social is really is really important. But you also want to be able to have the opportunities for some competitions as well. And that's where the leagues are. And I think the courses could promote their women's leagues maybe a little stronger, too. That's a really good point. The, the high school, you know, I grew up, uh, we practiced at, at SIM when I was in high school. Um, you know, I don't know how aggressively we go after uh, if staff calls um, USD 259 or, um, or each individual school, um, but maybe that's something that we can look, look into a little bit deeper. I know that that kind of limits us on you know, let's say school gets out at 3.30 or whatever it is, uh, they get over there at four o'clock. That kind of takes up um, some tea times, which might make the numbers look not so good um, in the short term. But when you look at it in a long term sense, going back to your point, Nancy, I mean, that if if girls start playing golf, understand the etiquette, understand the rules, eventually you're you hope that they get back into it. Um, whether it's for business purposes or social purposes, if their friend picks it up, whatever it may be, um, you know, I, I hope we take a long-term approach yeah. and view to that um, yes. rather than worry about a couple thousand dollars here and there that, you know, we may lose in the next, you know, two or three years. Yeah, so. promoting the sport for, for women in, in general. And we're planting the seed. And the same thing with the young golfers, you know, of, of – of any uh, ethnicity or anything. Yes, absolutely. I do Thank know from hearing a, a presentation from First Tee that women's, young women's golf in the high schools is booming. It's over, it's much more than, than men at this point. That's a, that, which is a good thing. You get young women playing golf, you know what's gonna happen? 
you got young men playing golf because that's the way it works. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a good, that is a positive thing. Uh, end of the day, I just hope that we looking forward, we set some benchmarks. This is all good talk, but let's set some uh, expectations. Let's have what six months from now at the end of the golf season, how did we do on this? Are there measurable objectives? And what made that happen? I'm going to go back to that. I hope there's a change of dynamic of how we use the clubhouses and the club personnel to drive that. Uh, that's a different mm -hmm. dynamic and requires some redesign. But let's think about six months from now. What's the, I'm going to ask this question six months ago. What did we do? Did we just talk? Did we just do? Is it all about apps and hits and whatever? But at the end of the day, it's rounds of golf and dollars in the till. We do offer a, a high school pass that we work with USD 259. And we also work with the Goddard school system because they use our golf courses as well. Um, and for the school season of 2017, we still had 227 high school players that play our golf courses. 2018, we had uh, 191. Uh, 2019, we had 157. Um, you can, you know, after the 2019 season, the 259 was actually looking at possibly uh, dropping high school golf because it was de declining in the high schools, um, but they haven't yet. Uh, what they do is that if their golf school, if the school does not meet expectations and have enough, say West High School doesn't have enough girls, then they will combine with like Southeast or South to, to form a team. Uh, so they, they will combine schools together in that respect. Uh, but we do work with those schools. Uh, I can tell you that uh, the two Goddard schools are full with their programs, both boys and girls. Um, Bishop Carroll was also full, but they have chosen to, to move from our golf courses to a uh, private club. Um, but we do work with those schools. We give them a great deal for those kids to be able to play. Um, you know, they play between three and four thousand rounds in the year uh, at no cost other than the, the flat hundred dollar fee that they pay. And one of the best part of the reason why we started this this uh, junior tours, you know, those that's something that we can those kids can participate in. Uh, I know uh, I was out at Auburn Hills and the Bishop Carroll coach at the time was talking about the high school match that the girls had just played and how those girls struggled and had a hard time. And, you know, they were. You know, but we had reached out to those schools in the spring when we started this junior tour to let them know they were going to do this because our golf, our pros stand on the tee and teach them how to keep score, what they're going to do, everything they need to be doing to be able to play a competitive round of golf. And I said, did you have any of those girls go do this this summer and, and encourage them to play in this? And he goes, no, I didn't. So, you know. Yeah, I think it's really important to continue to um you know promote a team atmosphere um especially at the high school level i grew up as a basketball and a baseball player team sports guy um i know you're going out there and, and shooting an individual score but you got your buddy right next to you that you're playing with four or five days out of the week after school um you know you might be struggling with something he might be struggling with something it's really important to lean on you know that camaraderie if you will and i think that what grows that's what grows the love of the game. That's what keeps them coming back. So if we can nurture that team atmosphere, if you will, I think that's a lot more important than, you know, we we sold a hundred passes to a high school kid that comes out every once in a while. I think it's well said, Eddie, and I'd reinforce that. Lincoln, Nebraska, every Wednesday through the summer, puts 300 senior golfers on the golf courses each week. That's our that's our benchmark. So I'm going to issue a challenge to I know Scott Weller and Steve Blask here online and, and Hendrick says that you guys need to step up. So I'd like to see at the next meeting put together the 10 things you need to see happen for you to be successful this next year. What do you need? And you're the you're the frontline people. You see the people come and go. So tell me by the next meeting what do you need to have for to, to make it happen so that we have a, a, a goal at the end of six months that we met uh, and what what's necessary? You guys are the professionals. I respect your your uh, your talents and your efforts. So is that unreasonable to ask? 
I'll defer to the pros here if they're still with us. It shows they still are. Yeah. Steve doesn't have a microphone. He might be able to type in the comments. I don't know about Scott. We can get back. If it's if it's something that's doable, think about it and we can put it on the agenda for next. You don't have to say right now, but uh, to me, those are the guys that are going to make it happen. And um, and maybe they need more uh, help. I don't know. It's, it's time for ideas. Steve just responded. He said he can do it. All right. I'm sure Scott will too. We uh, we kind of skipped over Kyle there. Kyle, are you still with us? I am. I am. My apologies. I actually I, I got a call, so I didn't actually hear what the question was. What was the question? <laughs> oh, just I mean, you work Who's with buying you lunch work? next week. You're buying lunch. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, <laughs> so you, you work with kids day in and day out. Um, right. You're also a young professional yourself. I just want to know how how do you think we can capture, you know, that the two part question here? How can we capture the kids? coming out there, um, playing the game of golf, getting them hooked on golf. I know we've got, you know, hook a kid on golf, uh, snag, junior league, all these different things. Um, and then the, the second part of that question, how can we capture the, the young professional group that, that you and I reside in? Right. Um, well, great questions. I think that, you know, when it comes to the kids, at least from my perspective, again, like earlier when, when we're going through and hearing the different programs, um, there were a couple of things that stood out to me. I'm like, oh, and I, and I golf, like I, I love golfing. Um, and I golf with a number of guys that golf, but truthfully, I actually didn't know several of those programs existed. And so, like I was saying before, like, you know, my job of course is to, to work with the kids, but I also got to raise dollars for these kids to have exposure to opportunities. So for example, like I have the funds to, when I'm hearing them program, I'm like, oh, well, as an avid golfer and having mentors that love to golf, I would love to put these kids into a, a, a golf camp or, you know, whatever. Because truth of the matter is, especially in the, the black community, but, in, you know, or in the black community, you know, typically camps and things that happen are going to be football, basketball, you know. Um, but the reality is that if a kid can pick up golf and do well, there, there's more opportunity for them to get a scholarship doing that then what the statistics and the the totality of how many kids are playing football and basketball they they have a, a higher shot in golf you know and so um you know for me I always have to look at everything holistically so i just think that i wonder about and i'm not and this is again like maybe maybe it has been out there maybe i've just been ignorant to it but how many other organizations like mine are just not aware of this opportunity of like, hey, we want you guys to come. We're willing to split it in half. We're willing to do scholarships. Um, or, you know, maybe it's just not, but this is what it costs. And, you know, for me, when I was hearing the numbers, I'm like, well, I could I could do that. So um, I think that there's an effort there. I love First Team. My daughter, she's nine. Y'all were talking about that a little bit ago. Um, she's nine. My daughter loves golf. She loves golf and basketball. Those are her two sports. Um, she did First Tee. Uh, this last season and she loved it she can't wait to get back into it she goes golfing with me all the time um but the thing that i learned about young people is just all about exposure and the earlier that we can expose them to something the better all my friends that you know if i talk about like the minority guys i golf with a lot of them say they weren't introduced to golf till they were in their 20s or 30s and they love the game now they love it um and we play all the time and you know I, matter of fact i'll use I use a because my daughter's always my example. Um, I was always scared of horses my whole life growing up. And um, when I was graduating, um, I, you know how you got like your last credits you need to get. Um, I took a horseback riding class. I wanted to challenge myself. I was 30 years old. And while I'm learning how to ride a horse, which now I love horseback riding. I love it, love it, love it. Um, but I was scared to death. So but one of the classes, they were like, well, hey, Kyle, bring your daughter. And it was just happened to be a time where she didn't have school and I had her. So I'm like, well, you have to come to class with me. And she at this time was five years old and she jumped on the horse like it was nothing. I mean, you know, brushing the horse, doing all those things. She wasn't scared. I'm scared. I was 30 years old. <laughs> and that moment taught me that exposure early is the key. My daughter had no fear because she was little. Me, I'm a grown man. 
shook. And so I think that if we can be intentional and get in front of so groups like mine, uh, maybe Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Boys and Girls Club, Rise Up for Youth, and and say, hey, here's something we want to extend to you to take advantage of. People will take advantage of it because, again, the mentors like we all golf, <laughs> you know, so why would we not want to, you know, it's something I've been wanting to um, do anyway. COVID kind of messed me up. To, well, it messed us all up, you know, um, but I was wanting to actually try to work with um, City of Wichita or maybe uh, uh, McDonald's specifically and doing a golf camp for our kids. But there's really no need, need to in reinvent the wheel. It's like there's already camps, just like listening to this call. There's already things that already exist. I just need to, I had, y'all need the kids. I have. <laughs> and so what it is, is getting to the, the entities that have the kids and saying, hey, we got the course, you got the kids, and let's, let's merge this thing. And um, I think, I mean, honestly, I think it's really as simple as that. Yeah, I mean, I, that was tremendously um you know said and i hope it was loud and clear for um everybody on staff and, and marketing troy I, I hope you took some notes i i certainly did um you know i think that those are actionable things that we can you know put into place and um hopefully six months down the line when dale asked us about it again we're seeing real numbers yeah I think it's really exciting to hear Kyle talk about that, that there are groups we haven't reached out to, the boys clubs, the big brothers, you're right, that would, you have to construct the golf program that's attractive to them. And, and but like Kyle said, you once you start playing like his daughter, you're going to get hooked. And that's what we're all about. I want to point out Nancy's, it's not just about minorities playing. It's a, to me, it's about inclusion. That means playing together. Nancy last year put together a tournament where she invited the McAdams Golf Club, the black golfers, to play with her women's group. And I got to play with them. It was phenomenal. It was well run. Everybody had a great time. It should have happened every week. It should be a monthly thing at least. But that's the kind of thing that makes people love golf. And that's where our efforts need to go. It's about social golf. You two are, are tremendous additions to this group. Thanks. And in the end of the day, you're going to be doing all the talking. Uh, that's, a, that's a great start. Uh, thank you, Eddie, for, for reinforcing that. Kyle, I wanted to jump on what you said and, and, and to Troy that there are a lot of great programs out there. Obviously, you keep sharing those with us. And, and, and for myself and Kyle, oh, OK, well, that's good to hear. We need to get those out. The people who are already playing golf uh, and who have the app and stuff like that, they know about maybe more of these things that are available, but we've got to reach those people who don't. And so getting them directly into the schools, directly into those uh, kids programs in the city, um, I think I think there's a lot of opportunities that we we have for promoting all of these great things that we already have. Agreed. Okay, and, and, I, and I'll throw out real quick that anything I could do to help facilitate those things, you know, um, I work heavily with USC 259 and uh, just saying, Troy, I'm a resource. Um, I'll reach out to you. All right, cool. I'll tell people, hey, but I'm, I'm a resource, not the source. I'm just a <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kyle. <laughs> all right, anybody else on the marketing plan? Okay, guys, really good discussion. Um, let's see, let's move on to uh, item D, green fee comparison. Uh, Mr. Godard asked, um, I think it was in November, kind of, uh, are we losing regular green fees to the membership? So what we went back to look at was uh, to do a comparison from 2015 forward. Uh, but what we have found is through our software, what we thought the reports we could run, it's not pulling things right because once we change Mr. Goder's uh, player type to a member, it recognizes all of his rounds previously as member rounds as well. So we're going to have to work with our software provider on how we can generate these reports. Uh, and so we aren't able to do that yet. But, you know, he'd ask about it. So I wanted to make sure we talked about it and. I can bring everybody up to speed on That's what my, my only concern is that the membership thing's great. We've got 1,100 members. 
If we doubled that next year and had 2,200 members all getting access to weekend golf green fees, at some point, do we lose those $25 green fees? Now I'm looking at the 2018 numbers. I have the comparison. I mean, in, in 2018, that regular green fees generated um, 101.6 million, and the membership generated 623,000. Those are the benchmarks. So when you go forward, if you double that membership, that's great. And the membership, I love the concept, Richard. You're you're right about what how that works. That guarantees your income through the year, but you have to look at the big number. Does the big number change? And that's what I'm looking for going forward. So, and and uh, we'll see that at once. I know that now that finance is running the numbers, so you don't have that big number. We need that big number at these meetings, though, Troy. So you're going to have to go to finance and say, when we have these meetings, we need to know where we are. We're the people in, in, that are overseeing the finances, so we need to know what is that number to date. Uh, and they need if finance is going to do it, they've got to generate that in, that information. So I hope we see it at the next meeting. Well, I, we were hoping that they would, uh, you know, Mr. Goder asked me, or I mean, not Mr. Goder, I mean, Mr. Uh, Schoenorf asked me that question uh, when we sent out the rounds report to earlier this year and you know, this month and uh, when we would have the revenue stuff. And I told him it was going to be the 16th or 17th when they would close the month. And it's now the 26th and they haven't closed it yet. So, I mean, we're just waiting on finance to get it finished. Eddie, are we still on the every six week schedule for meetings? I think we need to meet more often. Um, and I don't know how that could change. If it means a special meeting to do it, I think I'd like to see it in the next, over the next 30 days, I think there's gonna be clarity on where we are with our public golf system. And if we're gonna be, I love this meeting. This is the best golf advisory committee meeting I've ever participated in. Thanks to Nancy and to Kyle and to Niall and to Richard for that. This is a discussion I haven't seen before. That's great. So at going forward, but I think, uh, can we meet? Can we look at our schedule and perhaps if it's not scheduled, let's put it it's, in the schedule for a, a monthly? It's actually scheduled for March the 9th is the next one that's scheduled. The schedule's actually out on our website. Okay, that's way too late. We need to be meeting, I would think, no later than the first, second week of February. Um, oh, wait, what's the date? No, that's that. No, we don't. Maybe just a month out would be sufficient. Uh, Maybe February 26th or whatever that is. I, want to go into, I don't want to go into March. It's a different world now. When they put the eight to six week schedule in, I think we're at a, we have a more aggressive agenda, a lot of information to process. So um, if we might consider that on a monthly basis instead of every, and, and it ties into the park board schedule as well, if we can meet so it precedes the park board meeting so that they have the information to consider as well. The uh, the park, I think we still are on the six week, considering March 9th is yeah. probably about six weeks away. Um, yeah, you know, ob the obviously, the park board meets on the second Monday of every month. So, um, you know, if we do this monthly, are you thinking like the first Thursday of every month? What what would work for everybody? That'd be fine. Either that or the last Thursday, but just to have time to feed into the park board schedule. Sure. Yeah, I think that first Thursday sounds like a pretty good idea. I yeah, know that we won't, we won't have any financial information on the first Thursday because they won't have the month closed by then. Yeah, uh, yeah this is Emma. If I may chime in, I, I agree. At the beginning of the month is hard. They usually don't close until mid-month. So if you want the previous month and you do the first Thursday, you're not going to have financial data for sure. So. At what what day of the month is it available, Emma? Uh, usually it closes mid month. By this case, you should usually it closes. This is just a, a special year because of the new financial system. So I think that the other proposal will work. If you do last Thursday of the month, you will definitely have data of the previous previous month guaranteed. I mean, except this this month because it's end of year. But on a normal month, you will have it. Well, if it's the, if it's the first Thursday of the month, you'd have the previous month's closed numbers, right? No, not necessarily. It would be 40 days late. They usually have a 
five big months. But I think teens, you have it for sure um, for next year. So first Thursday, you know, right? Because it's the beginning of the month. That's too soon. But still, you'll have the previous month's data, which we hadn't would not have seen before. That would be fresh data, even though it's the previous month because we hadn't met. It really doesn't make any difference when we meet. Just to have the most current data available at that meeting, the most, uh, which might be from three weeks ago, but whichever. Um, yeah, it'll be a little. Yes, that's fine. And with that, will we be talking about the same time, um, a four o'clock or? Well, we have, we've been meeting at three, and we moved it to four o'clock to accommodate one of our golf committee members. And then probably me. My tour of duty ends at four o'clock, so okay. I appreciate that. I mean, I have no problem with that. Yeah. So, Kyle, does I'm, this time work for you? On a four Thursday, um, and now I'm a, I'm also I don't I'm assuming or maybe hopeful that if, if we're meeting more often like that, maybe they're not as long, but I would just probably have like a, a jump off by five or a little after five. But I mean, it will, I can make it work though, for sure. That's kind of where I'm at as well, um, but that's fine. I mean, I, I can make it work, um, but I'm in the same boat with possibly having to jump off. You know, this is a, this is running at hour and 45 and we're not even through item number two so um you know it's a little bit tougher but um you know it's fine uh i just want to make sure that you know everybody is is able to make uh the meeting um you know having a quorum is obviously important and then having input uh, from everybody is uh, crucial as well so Good. I'd prefer it not be on Tuesday if that's possible in the future. Okay. What's a good day, Nancy? Uh, Wednesday or Thursday for me. Those are fine for me. I'm open, whatever you need. Let's shoot okay. for Thursday. How about that? Thursday of the first, the first Thursday of, of, uh, the month. Okay. What does that do for February? When do we meet in February then? Yeah. We, well, that would be next Thursday. <laughs> would be next Thursday. And we don't need to do that. And that's not. So March 4th would be. I guess, okay, if we start that monthly thing and start in March, that's fine. We're going to be, uh, uh, at, it will be a lot to talk about. Well, that other thing is because you just talked about where we are in the agenda, unless we move some of those things in the agenda to, to next week and then we could actually start on that. Uh, just because no matter what, even next month, it'll still will be a week from that following Thursday. So either way we do it, it's going to happen. Yeah. I agree. I don't think we're going to have this extended of a conversation every meeting. If we met the first Thursday of February just to start that schedule, I don't think we're going to have a long meeting, but it might be timely. It depends if this first T thing shows up. Um, maybe it's just a special meeting at that point, Eddie. That when that shows up, that's a big deal by itself. Let me leave it open for that. You can call a special meeting to address that if we had to. I think that would be appropriate. That'd be good. And then we can put the March meeting as the first scheduled monthly meeting and do that in March, first sure. Thursday in March. Perfect. March. We'll put a new schedule together and we will send it out and we will update the website. Thank you. That's good. Thanks, Troy. Yeah. Anything else? We got uh, on item two. Uh, did we cover attendance? We talked over that to begin with and then we talked about maybe doing that the discussion at the park board meeting. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that was that was the first thing we kind of talked about. So. Anything else? So we would just I would just ask that the staff forward to the park board a report on attendance on the members who have not made the required free meeting um, requirement that's in the bylaws and let the park board then address that. Uh, we, we try to put the report together. We can do that. And it does hey, say how, much is left on, how much is left on the current agenda for tonight? 
Nothing. We're, we're as far as I'm concerned, we're done. I don't know about you, Eddie. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't have an update, so no continuation of prior business. Um, no Good. president update. If there's nothing else, we can go ahead and adjourn. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. It's nice Thank to be you in. Guys. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, y'all.